Mike Nicholson lost both legs and part of an arm in Afghanistan, but every day he puts his body to the test. In the pool at the South Tampa YMCA, he swims lap after lap. But swimming is just one of Mike's sports. Playing golf, doing wheelchair basketball, track and swimming. So, uh, so trying to get all four of those. This is Mike, his wife Katie, and their children at the Warrior Games in Chicago earlier this summer. He won six gold medals, three silvers and a bronze. The Warrior Games are an Olympic-style competition for wounded veterans, sponsored by the Defense Department. When it began in 2010, it was held on military bases with relatively small crowds. But this summer in Chicago, they held it off base in the city. When you open up to the public, we had 50,000 people in Chicago coming through. So, you know, I think Tampa could bring twice as many. As Nicholson now trains for an international competition, he's also become a voice to bring the games to Tampa. Special Operations Command at McDill has also expressed an interest in hosting the games. But as in Chicago, it's likely that most of the events would be at venues off the base in the city. Tampa Councilman Luis Vieira says City Council will send a letter to organizers saying Tampa is interested in the Warrior Games. And now what we're going to strive to do is to get other local elected officials, community stakeholders involved, so that we can kind of have a unified voice for the Tampa area uh, on trying to get these games here. He believes the games would bring thousands of visitors, but also show Tampa's support for wounded veterans like Mike Nichols. I mean, we're such a military-friendly city. I think it's just, you know, I, I think it's just fitting that we do do it. Um, we have the facilities. We, uh, we definitely have the passion behind it. The passion he shows every day, years after the sacrifice he made for his country, pushing himself to win. What makes Ebor Ebor? It's the rich history, the vibrant culture, and of course, those famous Ebor chickens. They have grabbed my heart, and I feel like they're a piece of our city. For local artist Lynn Rattray, their colors are astounding. They've become a source of inspiration. For me, it's all in the eyes and the body posture. This guy here that I'm painting, he's got his eye on Buckeye. She's painted more than 100 of these, and she admits she has a few favorites. Oh, I'm in love with the Colonel. Big, white, fluffy, fluffy, awesome chicken. He was there watching carefully as if critiquing her latest work. They all have their friends, they hang out with their mama, and um, they all sort of have a job to do. And that's what I'm trying to capture. <laughs> Ebor's most colorful characters can be traced back more than 100 years to the cigar factory workers. Each dip and stroke, a nod to their continuing tale. <laughs> They're uh, like a local treasure to me. I'm helping them tell their story. The rest of that story on full display inside the bunker in Ebor. Until March 4th, it's been up a couple of weeks. You have 63 Ebor chickens. Uh, some of them live over in the park, some of them live out back. All colorful, a bit quirky, and quintessentially Ebor City. I feel like I'm preserving a piece of of history. See, every time I think I'm finished painting chickens, they're just so adorably cute, I have to paint some more. Be careful where you step. It looks like an empty field, but it's not. It's not an empty field at all. Among the 1,500 graves that are marked at Tampa's Oaklawn Cemetery are familiar names of Ebor. Whedon and Henderson. I mean, this is the uh, gravestone of the first mayor. There are also vaguely marked Cuban pirates and lynched slaves. But the archaeologists here Friday. And you're going to see some what we call parabolas, these kind of curves. Are interested in those not marked at all. We're seeing some here that are, you know, I would suspect some of these are probably graves. In the middle of the three-acre property, thanks to magnetic and radar detectors that can peer up to 10 feet down, 
the USF team suspects there are 50 to 60 graves. There are a lot of monuments to famous people in the cemetery, but then there are a lot of people uh, who aren't, who don't have monuments that help build the city, some of the slaves and um, other people. So it's nice to kind of like give them a little bit of their dignity back by hopefully finding their graves. They're making a map with yellow lines marking what are likely rows of our ancestors. Now, don't forget where you came from. And where we came from is from these folks and these families. And be they rich or poor, free or slave, this, this is who we are. The subterranean mapping was ordered so that Tampa can put in for a national historic designation. They plan to mark each grave they find, not with a name, but with a reminder that they were here. They are here. We want to know. Uh, we want to pay respects to them. And then we want to make sure that this is a destination that people are proud of. Start over, Michael. We are ready. A professional recording studio. Who can show no shame? It's a far cry from the Sarasota city streets where Donald Gould was playing a year ago. A year ago, I figured I was just going to die out there living on the streets. But then again, Donald Gould is a far cry from the man he was a year ago. But his talent for making his fingers dance across the piano keys and a viral video would take Donald from homeless to artist. His quality of living is a lot better. I have my own place. I even have a pet cat, my Groucho. <laughs> He's made great strides, you know. Um, you know, there's always bumps in the road. You know, there's always things that, you know, obstacles that he has to overcome, but uh, he's really worked hard on his recovery. His take on redemption echoes in his music. Like other musicians, his soul reflects in each note. He's really playing from someplace personal. And uh, I think when he's behind the piano and people are like really listening to him, that that's where it comes out. And that's what he wants you to hear when you listen to his first album, set for release this fall. I said, wow, is this even still, is this really happening? And it, it gives me a feeling of gratitude and, and, and pride. It's the next step in Donald's evolution, from living on the streets to becoming famous overnight, even playing in an NFL stadium. I don't know what direction I'm headed, but I'm sure it's going to be in a positive direction. I think Donald's story is, is, is inspirational. <laughs> <laughs> Good job, Bird. It's on the 50! It's on 50! Yeah! yeah. <laughs> they say money doesn't grow on trees. That doesn't mean you can't find some hidden in the trunk or in the sand. Yeah. Yeah. Or maybe tucked into the dock. I didn't believe it at first. I thought it was a hoax. This one's in what? the volume on that. It's not a hoax, it's a hunt. A Florida treasure hunt. When I found it, I was like, wow. Like, this is real, this is a real $20 bill in my hand, and I was excited. What's on the things? The Treasure Hunts movement, which started last year in Colorado, go, 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 go. has officially made its way down south. Erica, Erica, we got the 50! <laughs> we hide the money, we post a picture on Facebook. Um, all you have to do is follow us. Bo Griswold, who lives in Colorado, came up with the idea last year. He's taking it nationwide just as a way to promote positivity throughout the state, um, get people outside off their cell phones and next year. So it's, it's moving really fast. Wait, what's next to the palm tree? Within minutes of clues being posted on the Florida Treasure Hunt's Facebook page. There's one down here somewhere. People in Indian Shores were on their feet, finding bill after bill. Which, how much did you get? Five? Five, here. Well, this was really fun because we were yeah. not expecting it at yeah. all. Yeah. From people saying that we're getting them out of depression, helping them get outside, to helping them get exercise. It's just special things like that to make it worth it. Max Bloss and his wife were the state's first happy hunters. Now he's a Florida ambassador, keeping the treasure hunt alive. I will be hiding money, whether it's Rennington Shores, Clearwater Beach, Indian Rocks Beach. So if I found it! You find it, you keep it. Yeah, we got it! <laughs> Look at these pictures. Who do you notice first? We just uh, came back from Camp David. Certainly, the president and first lady are most recognizable. We took a walk down Gorky Street in downtown Moscow. But something else they all have in common 
is Greg Mertz. I'm looking forward to someday when my grandchildren start learning history and they say, oh, Grandpa, Grandpa G was with President and Mrs. Reagan. Mertz served four presidents over 21 years in the Secret Service, starting with Ronald Reagan. He was assigned to the First Lady's detail in 1987. She was such a motivator and behind the scenes uh, leader, mentor, uh, partner, teammate with President Reagan. He trailed on horseback. He drove her. He did everything he could in all kinds of situations to keep her safe. During her Just Say No to Drugs campaign, Mertz was told that she'd be hoisted up at halftime by Charles Barkley to dunk a basketball. And so I was standing right outside of that picture, right under the basketball goal, almost like with my hands out, waiting for, for something bad to happen. The fond memories are more somber now. After she passed away, all of us you know, take it to heart. He says the way Nancy Reagan appeared to the public and the way she is being described now is how she really was. Mertz remembers the president's health scare towards the end of his administration. And every day when Mrs. Reagan left, she would thank uh, all the agents and all the nurses for taking such good care of her husband. And she was so, so humble and so sincere about it. Mertz seldom discusses his career or his protectees, but he came forward this time to salute a woman he adored and pledged to give his life for. For First Lady, she carried a big stick, and she was very, very well respected. Who the heck is that guy? Well, it's supposed to be Tom Brady in federal court. Online, it's anyone but the four-time Super Bowl winner. Maybe it's the Crypt Keeper or Gollum. How about... E.T. I just think that it's um, a bit unusual to see all of this time and energy going after a drawing. <laughs> Douglas Land is a courtroom sketch artist here in the Bay Area. He's covered some of the biggest cases in recent memory. I'm hired to go in and be the camera in the courtroom. Darken that a little bit. He says he's looking for specific characteristics to highlight. There's a little bit of like uh, exaggeration, there's some uh, caricature work. And to illustrate the emotion of the moment while staying impartial. It's a pensive moment, a lot of tension for. And uh, so I tried to capture that. I can do one of these in about 15 minutes. Uh, something like this I can do in maybe about a half hour. What you're trying to do is just get the essence of what it is. He says it can actually be harder drawing a famous face rather than a stranger. Someone that has a face that everyone knows, uh, it's difficult because uh, I think people can be quite judgmental. In the case of Brady's less than perfect portrait, artist Jane Rosenberg apologized for her work. I may not have made him look as handsome as he really is, and I apologize to the fans for that. I'm not really part of the social media world, so it was uh, kind of shocking how many people are like, how I'm the story, like that's ridiculous. That's social media for you. It's enough to make some people scream.